Hiya. I, I want to start off, if you don't mind, in the pub. And more specifically, this is a pub in the centre of Newcastle. It's June 2016. We're about a week before the EU referendum. And I'm up there doing something I did quite a lot before the referendum, which is a Q&A session about what that vote was going to mean for the country. And about halfway through what I was saying, I said something like, every serious economic commentator is predicting that if we leave the European Union, our GDP is going to end up being smaller than it would have been if we'd stayed in. Okay? And at that point, a woman, about three quarters of the way back, and to my eternal regret, I never got her name, but I'm going to call her Nora for the sake of alliteration. She stands up and she screams, that's your frigging GDP, not mine. And she stopped me dead in my tracks. And partly she did so because she'd put her finger on a problem with the way academics like me and many politicians like to talk about our country. Because what we often do is we use broad generalizations and we use fancy acronyms to describe the state of the economy. But the problem for Nora and for her mates, and they were very, very insistent on explaining this to me at the bar afterwards, was what these acronyms didn't do was reflect the lives they led. Because their lives were getting harder. And yet at the same time, the government was saying things like recovery, shared prosperity, we're all in this together. And so it shouldn't surprise us to learn that they weren't just angry about the economy, they were fed up with politics too, and because they thought that politicians just simply didn't get it. And worse than that, not only did politicians not get it, but there was nothing they could do about it because they thought their votes didn't count. One of them said to me, you could shove a red rosette on a donkey here and it would win. All right? So they're there feeling stuck feeling stuck with two parties saying broadly the same thing, both embracing an economic ideology that hasn't worked for them, and they didn't think there was anything they could do about it. And they had a point, because in some senses at least, both our politics and our economy are rigged. Rigged not because there's someone there cheating deliberately every day, nor, and I want to make this clear, because politicians are venal or in it only for themselves, because actually all the politicians I know are neither but rigged in the sense that our politics and our economics produce systematically and structurally outcomes that privilege some groups over others, help some people do better than others. And it's this that they resented. Think back to Britain in 2016. This is a country where, effectively, a vote for one of the two big parties is 100 times more powerful than a vote for UKIP. It is a country in which only the economically vulnerable pay the price for economic failure. So, the banks crashed the economy, people on benefits paid the price. In your average school classroom in this country in 2016, nine of the 30 kids, that's over four million of them in the country as a whole, were living in poverty. With figures like that, it's easy to understand why people thought politicians just didn't care. And I want to give you one specific example of the kinds of things we were doing wrong. I want to talk about transport. Back in 2016, Spending on transport per head in London was 950 quid. In the rest of the country, it was 350 quid, which is bad enough, but it gets worse because not only does London get more money, but London decides what money is spent and how on the rest of us. And people in London, and in Westminster in particular, are obsessed with high-speed trains, which is nice. The problem is the vast majority of people don't get high-speed trains. In fact, if you look at the data, the vast majority of people don't take trains at all. So, last year, your average Londoner took 100 train journeys. In the northeast of England, that figure was six. And if you drill down and you think about the poorest people in our society, think about the poorest fifth of families in our society, you're talking about people who, on average, took 10 times more bus than train journeys. And yet, over the last five years, some 17,000 bus routes have been axed. Now, these are the kind of bread and butter issues that really matter to people. And so when a referendum comes along, in which every vote is going to count equally, we shouldn't be wholly surprised that a number of them use them to voice their displeasure. Now, I'm not saying for a moment that this is the only reason why people voted leave. God knows a lot of people voted leave for a lot of different reasons. But when you're talking about people like Nora, one of the reasons was to voice discontent with the state of their own lives. And I suppose what I'm saying is, for many of these people, the issue at stake on that fateful day in June 2016 wasn't Boris Johnson's big red bus. It was whether or not their own crappy, underfunded, unreliable bus service was going to turn up at all. And so when, you were, when they were confronted 
with a choice between a status quo that was failing them and a future, an alternative future, however vague it was, and God knows it was vague, 17 million people plumped for the latter. And for many of those people, this was the first time they'd actually won at the ballot box. And they felt this viscerally. I remember chatting to a mate of mine, a schoolmate from Wakefield, who shares my rather sad obsession with Leeds United. And he said to me, you remember when Leeds were shit? And the only pleasure in life was watching Man United lose. That's, that's how we think. Uh, and he said, well, Brexit's like that. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and he grinned, and he counted it off on his fingers. Blair, Miliband, Cameron, Osborne, Clegg. We've pissed them all off. All right? So the question now is, what do we do about this? And I suppose, broadly, we've got three alternatives, haven't we? We could ignore the referendum. We could say, well, vote leave cheated, or we asked the wrong question, or people didn't know well enough what they were voting about. But I think that misses the point that there is genuine grievance lying behind many of those votes in that referendum. Or we can say we can fix this by defining a new relationship with the European Union. And yes, that matters, and my God, our relationship with the European Union is an important one and it will continue to be. But again, the danger with that is it misunderstands the fact that many people are voting to protest about the way things are done here rather than anything else. And I think it is that fundamentally that we need to address. And the question is how. Now, I don't want you to panic. I'm not going to stand here for the next six minutes and give you a detailed policy manifesto, if only because I'm one of the very, very few people in the country who really doesn't want to be leader of the Conservative Party, I promise you. <laughs> but I think what we can do is make a start. And the first thing we need to do is understand the problems we face. And I think here we go back to Nora, because what she did better than I can is explain the problems inherent in dealing with generalizations. British GDP is going up. It doesn't tell you how Glasgow is doing or how Newcastle is doing. It hides a lot of reality. So we need to think about how we describe things and how we talk about things. But beyond that, we also need to accept the fact, I think, that our problems aren't just economic. They're political as well. They're about process as much as about outcomes, about control as much as about outcomes. And that many of the outcomes we see in this country come about because the processes that generate them are simply not fit for purpose. Let me start with one obvious example. Our electoral system no longer works. Now, it used to work just fine. In fact, it, 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 has, it still has its strengths. It creates that fantastic link between constituency and constituency MP, which I think is worth its weight in gold. And it used to, of course, provide what we used to call strong and stable government. But, of course, it no longer does. And now it no longer provides that strong government. The trade-off between strong government on the one hand and the fact that some votes don't seem to count as much as others on the other is no longer as appealing as it was. So we need a new electoral system. We need one that combines that constituency link with a greater degree of proportionality. But even if we did that, we'd still be left with the problem that our country is fundamentally too London-centric. Government is based in London. The majority of the civil service are based in London. And people based in London tend to think like London thinks. Think back to what I said about high-speed trains. So actually, perversely, maybe we do need to think about GDP after all. But not GDP as in gross domestic product, but GDP as in genuinely devolved power. We need to start a process of dispersing power away from London towards the towns, cities, and regions of this country. We need to start a process of giving local areas greater control over their own destinies. And finally, and most importantly, we need to start a system whereby we get central government to do less so that it can do better. And happily, there are already really good examples of this kind of thing working. Think about Wigan, which is not a phrase you're going to hear very often today, I reckon. <laughs> In Wigan, the Wigan deal was a way of allowing people to take greater control over local services. It literally gave them ownership of local spaces via charities and voluntary organisations. And the outcomes as a result, whether it's health or general well-being, went up. Down the road in Preston, the council came up with this ingenious scheme to take public procurement contracts and break them up into bite-sized chunks. And what this meant was that local firms could not only bid against the big multinationals, but win against them. And what this meant was that jobs and spending were retained in the local area. Local control. Because after all, a civil servant based in London, however bright, however well-qualified, however well-intentioned, might not be as well qualified to understand the problems of Paisley 
as a local resident. You'll notice I stuck in a Glasgow reference there to keep you all sweet. Uh, so I'm talking about local control here. And as importantly, I'm talking about a process that allows people who for too long have felt like objects of a system to start to feel again like they are participants in that system. But even if we do that, even if we genuinely disperse power to the regions and towns, we will still need strong action by central government. And that will require choices, and it will require difficult choices. Why? Because sadly, so sadly, we've still not found that magic money tree. And we're going to have to take difficult spending decisions. Let me give you two examples of the sorts of things we're going to have to do. Firstly, the middle class, people like me, might object to the notion that our assets should be fairly taxed. But my God, should our assets be fairly taxed. Why? Because asset inequality is far more pernicious in the impact it has on social mobility than income inequality. The Institute for Fiscal Studies recently, in a shocking report, I thought, found that when it comes to the degree to which your inheritance determines your wealth, we are no better than we were in Victorian times. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, I think the better off will probably have a problem with the idea of paying more tax to pay for better education, vocational training, skills. But again, we have to. Why? Because this country suffers from an appalling and stark productivity differential. Your average worker in the southeast of England produces in one hour 7% more than her German counterpart. In the rest of the country, that figure is 22% less. And the only way to address this differential is via proper skills training. That is a way to start to reduce the productivity differential because that productivity differential itself lies behind many of the regional inequalities I've spent so long talking about to you already. Now, what I'm not doing is promising for a moment that these things are going to be easy. There are really difficult choices ahead of us. But the bright side is that in addressing these sorts of issues, we'll not only be helping Nora from Newcastle, that's the alliteration I promised you right at the start, we will also be helping all of us. Why? Because less unequal societies are more successful societies. Look across the indicators of social well-being, whether it's mortality rates, education rates, even if this is what you're interested in, recycling rates, and they are better in less unequal societies. So in this sense, I think that referendum where I started back in 2016 should have served as a wake-up call for all of us. It should have alerted us to the profound levels of public discontent that exist in this country. And if the last three years have taught me anything, it's that letting that kind of discontent fester via political inaction is the worst thing we can do. So let me end on a more positive note. Seen through this lens, Brexit presents us with a host of opportunities. It presents us with an opportunity to recognize what we were doing wrong. It presents us with an opportunity to understand our failures, failures we should have recognized and acted on years ago, but for some reason chose to ignore. And in short, an opportunity to build a country that works better. And these, let me tell you, are opportunities we simply cannot afford to squander not only for Nora's sake, but for all our sakes. Thank you very much.